Good afternoon and welcome to the House Environment and Energy Committee. This afternoon we are going to be looking at H657, an act relating to the modernization of Vermont's communications taxes and fees. First witness is Representative Sims, who is the bill's sponsor and I think also reporter. Thanks, uh, Madam Chair Committee, Kevin Sims, Crestbury. Uh, appreciate the opportunity um, to maybe provide a high level overview about the um, thinking behind H657, an act relating to modernizing Vermont's telecommunications, taxes, and fees, uh, knowing that you have a bunch of other witnesses after who uh, can walk through the legislative language and answer all the fiscal um, questions. Uh, so we had a working group this summer um, that uh, you know crafted this bill uh, with our core focus being about modernizing telecommunications, taxes and fees, something that hadn't been looked at by the legislature in a number of years, and to try to be more competitively neutral in um, our taxes and fees and ensure adequate revenue to support um, public benefits related to our telecommunications uh, infrastructure. And there were th there are th kind of three big issues um, that were highlighted in recent legislative responses reports that we were seeking to address. The first, uh, declining revenue in the Universal Service Fund, which has been leading to insufficient funds to sustain E911. Declining revenue in the outdated uh, telephone personal property tax. And the third piece of VTRANS not being in compliance with statute to execute lease agreements with broadband and wireless providers using state-owned right-of-ways. And so at a high level, I can just kind of walk you through each of those pieces. Um, so as you may be familiar, um, folks pay a uh, universal service charge on your phone bills, and that raises just under six million a year and its revenues have been declining for several years. And the universal service fund supports um, five programs in order of priority. This is a waterfall where the program at the top gets funded and then over to the next program. Um, the Vermont Community Broadband Board is at the top, and then Lifeline, Telephone Relay, E911, and the Connectivity Fund. Um, and current revenues have been insufficient to sustain E911's program costs for several years, and we've been backfilling that shortfall with general funds. And part of the reason for the decline uh, in revenue is because um, of changes in the market. So the universal service charge has been 2.4% on retail voice telecommunication services. And so if you have a landline, you're paying 2.4% on the cost of your landline, but as more folks shift to wireless, the companies consider a smaller and smaller portion of your bill the voice service. So you're paying 2.4%, but only on a portion of that fee uh, of the bill amount. Um, so even though consumers like spend about the same on telecommunications services, and we have a stable number of lines, the revenue generated from that has been declining. And so in 2022, the Agency of Administration recommended in a memo um, changes to ensure the long-term sustainability of E911. And the bill implements one of those recommendations, which is to move from the percent charge to a per line fee, which is something that a number of other states have done. And given that um, the number of lines in Vermont is relatively stable, in fact, growing a little bit, should stabilize the revenue um, to support the Universal Service Fund program beneficiaries. So that's section one of or bucket one. <laughs> we have sort of three, uh, all related under the umbrella of uh, telecommunications, but kind of distinct uh, shifts. So universal service fund is one piece of the bill. The second is the telephone personal property tax. So that was put in place in 1947. And the tax applies to people who own or operate a telephone line or business, um, paying a 2.37% charge on the net book value of the assets. In 2021, the Vermont Tax Structure Commission report recommended repealing the telephone personal property tax, given that its revenues have been declining year after year as folks' net book value declines, and that it's you know somewhat outdated um, given the focus on telephones, um, which were our primary um, communications tool in 1947, but technology has changed a little bit since then. We have more wires coming into our houses. Um, and so our report, um, or our, our bill um, 
advances that recommendation of repealing the telephone personal property tax, which is one of like 36 small special type taxes and um, replaces that by putting telecommunications property on the grand list as real property. So we're moving away from net book value on only telephone to all telecommunications providers on the grand list at fair market value. And it modeled after what we do with um, electric utilities, uh, PVR would provide the technical expertise to provide the assessment of the telecommunications infrastructure that would be provided to local listers and that value would be um, added to the grand list. Um, Again, we see this as sort of more competitively neutral, will help uh, reduce the administrative burden at tax um, and provide um, uh, more, more steady revenue. <clears throat> um, the third piece is the state right of way uh, lease agreement. So VTRANS um, has a statutory requirement to obtain some form of compensation from broadband and wireless providers using state owned right of ways. This has been on the books since 2007, but um, We've had multiple memos from the auditor, um, including one in 2022, that's called to the legislator's attention that despite being on the books for 17 years, the trans um, uh, is not currently uh, assessing the um, uh, lease agreement and charges with broadband and wireless providers using the state right of way. So this bill adds some specificity about the charge that VTRAN should be providing, has a report back to report on the progress making implementing that and one of the things that we heard from VTrans testimony was that they um, part of part of the challenge in assessing the fee is knowing what's on our state owned right of ways um, and so the bill would ask incumbent providers to provide an inventory of all of the um, things that are on state uh, owned right of ways so that uh, it's should likely be easier for VTrans to move forward with that assessment. It also, um, at the request of VTrans, includes a uh, temporary person and one um, uh, ongoing position to support the administration of the fees. We expect that the revenue generated should cover that cost on an ongoing basis. Um, but as JFO will tell you, it's, it's hard to estimate the revenue potential not knowing how many miles of uh, wires we're talking about. Um, the other thing that that section does, and again, um, we heard in testimony from VTrans, maybe part of the rationale for not fulfilling their statutory obligation to assess a fee um, is that we also have a goal around building out broadband to underserved communities. Um, and uh, we sought to kind of reconcile this by clarifying that the Entities that are doing that work of deploying broadband to our more underserved areas, our communication union districts, the private providers who are partnering with broadband providers to fulfill the um, universal service plan and our small telephone companies would be e exempt from that state right of way fee so that we can honor the work that folks are doing to build out broadband to underserved areas, but also ask that um, incumbent providers who are using state land to pay a reasonable fee that we set by looking at uh, what other states are doing in this area. So those are the three kind of big buckets of trying to take a high level look at telecommunications taxes and fees, uh, be more competitively neutral, solve some declining revenue issues, um, and happy to answer any questions. Thank you for the overview. Um, <clears throat> what does competitively neutral mean? Well, so I, th I think the example of that is the um, telephone uh, personal property tax. So right now we have a special tax type that um, asks telephone companies to uh, pay a personal property tax based on the net book value of their assets, but we do not charge a similar um, tax for uh, cable providers or broadband providers. And so we're repealing that and we're asking all telecommunications providers to uh, have their uh, assets on the grand list as real property. So if you have stuff that has high value, that's great. And let's pay an appropriate amount uh, to support all the public benefits that government provides. Members, do, do members have questions? We, are, we will hear from Legislative Council more in-depth review of the bill. Um, Representative Smith then. Thank you. Two point three seven percent. 
<clears throat> is the tax proposal increase? No. Okay. Uh, explain that to me then, please. Yeah. So right now on the books, there's a telephone personal property tax put in place in 1947. It applies to persons that own or operate a telephone line or business and they pay 2.3% charge on the net book value of their assets. And we would be repealing that. So that would go away. Okay. In lieu of that, uh, things would be listed on the grand list as real property. Are there additional taxes? There are additional fees in this bill, though, aren't there? Uh, the other uh, fee pieces are we currently have the universal service charge, which is 2.4% yep. of your voice services, and we would be replacing the percent charge with a per line fee okay. of 72 cents. Oh, it's, not gonna, it's not a big impact on anybody paying any additional monies for services rendered. No, so we're trying to stabilize revenue um, and move to uh, a, a more stable base, Good. which is the number of lines. And um, I imagine many folks in your district are like mine that, uh, you know, still retain landlines. Um, and uh, in most cases, the 72 cent per line would be uh, less than the 2.4% being paid now. So it's a more equitable distribution of um, uh raising revenue to support E911 and the other beneficiaries. And the third piece is the state right of way um, lease agreement for folks who have broadband um, or telecommunications infrastructure on state right of way. That's something that has been on the books for 17 years and we're just trying to help make that happen. Good. All right, thanks. And so the universal charge of 72 cents for lines would be monthly? Yes. Representative Clifford. Thank you, Madam Chair. I think uh, my question was already answered by Representative Smith's question, actually, as far as, you know, the fee structure is and, and how uh, the rate payers, you know, what's, what's their gonna, impact's going to be. But I think you just answered that question because you're repealing one, so it's kind of a wash. Yeah, our, our, our <laughs> goal here was to be as uh, revenue neutral as possible and focus more on modernizing to better capture current technology and stabilize, get the right base. Um, not not trying to raise a lot more revenue, but modernize to reflect current technology. Thank you. Representative Bongart. I'm sure you said this at the beginning, but I... It's, it's all right. This is a super wonky bill. I did not um, include this in my town uh, meeting. Yeah. <laughs> purpose of all of this is to make sure that there's still sufficient revenues to support the United Dawn. Yes. We will, uh, in FY26, no longer need to backfill... E911 with general funds. Thank you. Legislative Council. Hi, Maria Royal with Legislative Council. Um, Representative Sims did an excellent job providing an overview. Um, and before I go through kind of a line by line of the bill, one other thing, and I'll really just call it to your attention um, because a lot of this uh, reflects what Representative Sims just explained, kind of the big picture outline of the subjects. Uh, great, so that's come up. So, and this might just help if you want to go back and kind of get a broad sense of what's covered in the bill. So, as already explained, yep, three sections, components of the bill. The first part, sections one through six, dealing with the universal service fund and changing the contribution method. And again, we'll talk about that in detail, a flat per line fee as opposed to a 2.4% portional charge on the monthly telephone bill. Um, so we'll go through some of the definitions there and some of the exemptions. Um, and then changes to property tax, the repeal of the telephone personal property tax, and then basically treating all communications property. That includes voice, telecommunications, broadband, cable television facilities, 
um, as uh, real estate and putting it on the grand list as real estate um, and treating it basically very similar to the way electric utility poles and wires are treated now in terms of property taxes. But again, we'll go through the, uh, these sections in greater detail. And then finally, the right of way fee that would apply to communications property and state owned rights away. So that is there. I'm going to close that and then we'll actually walk through the language in the bill as amended by ways and means. So with respect to the, yeah. I'll just point out to members that the table that Maria just showed us is up under her name on our committee page. Just grab my glasses. <laughs> Sometimes helps if I can see. Not always. So with respect to the universal service fund, how much background, what, what, what's most helpful to the committee before we kind of dive in? on the details do you high level reminder of the i mean catherine mentioned them that helps but one more mention would be great of the fee and where it goes okay so this is a fund that's been around i think since the early 90s um it funds specific programs 911 being the biggest um user of those fees um or revenue that's raised but the other programs that are funded um the relay service, which is a service for deaf and hearing impaired, Lifeline, Vermont Lifeline, which is the state subsidy for voice service. There's a federal Lifeline program funded with federal monies. Um, there's also money that's specifically allocated for the Vermont Community Broadband Board. Um, and finally, any remaining funds uh, would go into separate fund, the connectivity fund, which funds the grant program for broadband build out and subsidizes the incumbent providers also with broadband. So that's, as Representative Sims mentioned, it is a waterfall. So to the extent there's not enough money to fully fund everything, they're funded in the order of priority that's listed in statute. Um, and very often there isn't any money left over. So there's nothing that gets into the connectivity fund. But do the others get fully funded from it currently? So no. Uh, so relay service, um, the way they're listed now, the fiscal agent who administers the fund gets paid first. Um, there's a percentage, it's about 16.6% .6 under current law. This is gonna sound more confusing than it is. Under the proportional charge existing law, years ago it was 2%, right? You paid 2% of your telephone bill. I think in 2019 or maybe before then, you increased it to 2.4%, but you specifically said that that money raised from that incremental increase of 0.4% specifically should go towards broadband, right? So that comes off the top, no waterfall there. Um, and then relay service, then lifeline, then 911. And that's where it stops because for years you haven't had enough money in this fund to fully fund 911, which as Representative Sims mentioned is why the general fund has been called upon to kind of backfill the 911 budget. So part of the impetus here is to provide a sustainable funding source for all of the programs um, and not have to every year kind of backfill based on the needs of those programs. Um, so that's very high level in kind of making some of the changes and working on the definitions. We also went through in ways and means and tried to update some of the terminology because some of these terms have been on the books for a very long time. So there is some updating of definitions. And I'm just mentioning that there's there may be some there may be additional updating that needs to happen in this chapter. Um, but I just wanted you to you know understand why some of the broad definitions have been changed. And so, for example, 
um, telecommunication service. This is really just a clarification and, and trying to make it sync up with the way the terms are used throughout the chapter. Just specifying that telecommunication service means the transmission of any real-time interactive communications through the public switch network, so basically voice services. Um, however it's delivered, whether it's over a fiber line, wireless facilities, or the copper lines. So, um, and because, um, so right now the charge does apply to interconnected VoIP service, um, but just wanting to specify that in the general definition section. So that's why on line eight, you'll see now specific reference to interconnected VoIP service. Um, and then similarly on line 10, that definition, mobile telephone or telecommunication service, just citing kind of the way that term is currently used in federal law uh, and citing the federal definition for mobile telecommunication service. So those are really just updating the definitions. So section two, bless you, um, is where we actually uh, address the charge that's imposed on retail telecommunications. Um, some updating of the language. So, yeah, I would actually characterize this as more updating. Um, so some of the terms that came up, initially when they came up, they came up in reference to definitions that were in the new section of law. Um, we then went back and looked at, well, there are some existing places that can just be, those definitions can change. And so what you see here in subsection C, defining you know, what is a place of primary use when you're looking at interconnected VoIP service, or mobile telecommunication service, um, you just specifically describe um, how, those, how those terms are defined. So with respect to interconnected VoIP service, the universal service charge is imposed when the customer's place of primary use is in Vermont. As used in the subsection, the term place of primary use means the street address where the customer's use of interconnected VoIP service primarily occurs or a reasonable proxy as determined by the interconnected VoIP service provider, such as the customer's registered location for 911 purposes. So this is pretty consist consistent with how the federal law defines where you determine uh, the use of the services. So then section three um, is where the rate is established. So you'll notice it leads with an exception, except as provided in subsection seven, uh, 7521 subsection E, yep, E, um, which pertains to prepaid wireless service. So this whole change to a flat fee per line and service applies to everything but prepaid wireless. Prepaid wireless, you're not, it's not postpaid, you're not getting a monthly bill for your service. You might walk into a retail store, buy a calling card, buy a phone, buy, right? You're buying a card that then you can access telephone service and it might be for 10 minutes, it might be for whatever, right? So that collection method, that proportional charge of 2.4% is actually gonna stay the same. So retailers will continue doing what they're doing with respect to prepaid wireless calling. Um, and part of the reason for that is one, they don't have to change what they're doing, their software and the retailers have a system in place. Um, and two, because you can buy services that are in very small increments, very small denominations, $10, $15, and that's a, a 70 cent charge on top of that might be considered uh, disproportionate. And some people also might buy services more than once a month. So again, just trying to be a little bit more equitable um, based on the, the customers who tend to use those services and how frequently. So that's just the exception I wanted to call out. Um, then after that exception, the monthly rate of charge shall be 72 cents for each retail access line and service. Um, 
There's a definition for access line and service, which we'll get to. But before getting to that, um, and that's down, you'll see in subdivision three, but also what's specified here in subdivision two is how do you determine the number of access lines that a customer has? So the proposed definition here, and I'll just read through it once and then we can talk about it. Um, the number of access lines a telecom service provider provides a customer shall be deemed equal to the number of inbound or outbound, whichever is greater, two-way communications by any technology that the customer can maintain at the same time as provisioned by the provider's service. This is a definition that's very similar to a definition that the California Public Utility Commission uses with respect to their line charge. There was a lot of conversation about this definition where it got a little bit tricky. And I think some of the confusion was for most customers, it's pretty clear how many lines you have. Um, but for business entities, calling centers that might have the ability to distribute telephone calls to hundreds of people, but not all of those people can make a call, an outbound call at the same time. They're limited in the number of incoming or outbound. That's where it got a little bit confusing. And that's what's intended to be addressed here. Um, yeah. And I'm fine if there are no more questions on that section. That took up a lot of time and ways and means. Are there questions up? <laughs> But if the, if there are concerns about it, I, it was the best attempt to try to capture what's intended here, and also be mindful that there are some businesses that you know might not be equitable to charge for the number of lines within a business, especially if they can't all make a call at the same time. So, in terms of what an access line is under this proposal, it means a wire or wireless connection that provides voice telecommunication service to or from any device used by a customer, regardless of technology, that is associated with a 10-digit telephone number um, or other unique identifier and with a service location or place of primary use in Vermont that is capable of accessing the 911 system. So pretty much any time you have a telephone number and you can make voice calls and you can access 911. Well, that's what's gonna be covered here, which is what I think most of you would expect to be covered, for, right? There is an exemption, uh, customer enrolled in the Federal Lifeline Program or the Vermont Lifeline Program or both is exempt from the charge established by this chapter. And then from the monies that are collected by the charge under this chapter, 17%, so right now about, you know, that 0.4% that's specifically designated to the board. So that's represents about 16.6% .6 of the money raised. So this is specifying that 17% of the money raised shall go to the Vermont Community Broadband Fund um, it will be more, and Ted's going to talk a little bit more about the money issues, but it will be more than they're getting now because you're raising more money. So it's 17% of a larger bottom line. But I just wanted to clarify that there's still that um, transfer distribution of funds. So then um, section Four, um, that is specifying the 2.4% for prepaid wireless. Question for Rick. Yes. Devin. Yes. Thanks. Um, the flow down, the first one is E911? Or no, that's the fourth one. Yeah, so the first, it's the, well, so first that 17%. Right. Taken <clears> off. <throat> then the fiscal agent. Then relay service just for hearing impaired. Then lifeline. Then 911. There is a proposal in here to add an additional program, the Vermont 988 program. 
and a follow-up question. Is there any chance, um, I mean, there have been ongoing challenges with, uh, you know, making sure E911 has the funds needed. Is there any chance, even though I see that there's, you know, a few million dollar more from this these proposed changes, is there any chance that that flow down will still mean that E911 doesn't have what it's need, need what it needs? That'd be a great question to confirm with 911. I believe under this, on the revenue that's anticipated here, it's enough to fully fund them. Whether they're anticipating additional needs in the future, the, that program growing and it will outlive this, I, you know. But as structured, this as structured and yeah, and Ted can speak a little more specifically to exactly how much money goes to each of those programs and how much has been appropriated through the general fund over the years and that that was taken into consideration in setting this fee to make sure that it, there wasn't a shortfall. So, thank you. So that, that was the intent of the Ways and Means Committee. That was a big part of the intent yeah. over the years, looking at this fund, knowing that it didn't raise enough money to fully fund the programs it was designed to fund. That's been an ongoing discussion and that's, Part of why ways and means and updating the fee structures, making sure that. And so you can see actually in here, this is the, the priority list or the distribution list of the fund. You know, line 17, fiscal agent, two relay service, three lifeline, four 911. After that is the new program. All right, what page are you on? Uh, page seven. Oh, was that? Did I never share my screen? Well, you had the table up, but not the bill. You should have told me that. I had. We're, oh my we're, God, I'm we're, sorry. We usually do the screen. Oh, you don't. We okay. Usually look at it ourselves, so it's not a problem for us. I'm so sorry. I the whole time I assumed you were I looking be right at me. me. So of course it I'm makes. Following sense. till then. It okay. Was fine. Okay. No, this is good to know. All right. Sorry. <laughs> so I'm on page seven. Um, and I'm just reading, uh, you know, down the list of how the, the money is distributed to the various programs. And so you'll see the new program, Vermont 988 Suicide and Crisis Lifeline Centers. Um, that comes after 911. And at the very bottom is the Connectivity Fund, which provides funding for connectivity, the Connectivity Initiative and the High Cost Program, basically broadband deployment. Um, And, and net, right now, the connectivity initiative is administered also by the Vermont Community Broadband Board. But I don't think there's any money in there. And I'm going to quickly look at Ted. I don't know that any money actually trickles down or much money trickles down at this point under the current. But we can you know, talk about that a little bit more. So in terms of, um, so there's a new section here uh, specifically defining the Vermont 998 Suicide and Crisis Lifeline. Um, the money goes to the Commissioner of Mental Health to fund the operational and capital costs of the Lifeline Centers, the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline Centers, within annual limits approved in advance by the General Assembly. And I know Ted is going to talk a little bit more about how much money has been appropriated already, and there is um, some anticipated loss of federal funding. So there'll be some discussion about what they're hoping to achieve to be fully funded. But just wanted to call out here that this is all subject to the General Assembly's um, approval by appropriation. So that's it for the Universal Service Fund. Are there any questions or things you'd like to go back and review at this point? Representative Sebelia. And I'll ask you, Maria, I, you know, since is still here, was there any discussion about um, the ACP replacement in this bill? <coughs> so the only new thing that we're adding here is the 988. Only new program. Yep, you're changing the contribution method and adding one new program. Uh, ACP, um, no, actually, I can't, um, but it's the, uh, it's a federal subsidy that was put in place. Um, 
uh, during COVID um, affordability that uh, I believe is about $30 a month that uh, is going away. <clears throat> and uh, it actually is a subject of great discussion um, on our half a billion dollar public <coughs> build out that's happening right now, both between CUDs and uh, Vermont Community Broadband Board. <clears throat> Affordable connectivity program. Thanks. Any other questions on the fund? And if Sims. It would be helpful to just hear a little context about the why the 988 um, was added and could address maybe share other things we're doing around the affordable circuit. Um, so part of the um, rationale here is um, when people need help, you want them to pick up the phone and call the right place. And I think increasingly we know that 911 is sometimes the appropriate um, place to call for help, but sometimes 988 uh, mental health and suicide crisis hotline is the other number that you might want to call. And so given that this is a assessment of voice services, people who can make calls um, felt that there was a really kind of direct connection here between the um, fee and then the programs that are providing uh, answering the phones and uh, you know sending the appropriate support to folks who need them. Um, we are, just in case it's helpful, in the context of another bill, um, where we're considering a streaming tax, um, looking at uh, a study to have the Vermont Community Broadband Board uh, uh, study and report back to the legislature about establishing a broadband affordability uh, program, knowing that the federal ones may be disappearing. And so uh, we have been having some of those conversations about the broadband affordability um, subsidy programs and needs in the future, but having out of the context of a, a different bill. So I, I guess I would love to see our committee, which has jurisdiction of broadband, actually uh, have that discussion. So, Any other questions on the Universal Service Fund? Okay, so that brings us um, to page eight, starting with section seven. And these are the property tax provisions applicable to communications property. That first section, section seven, repeals the telephone personal property tax um, and the alternative gross revenue tax, which is an existing alternative to the telephone personal property tax. These are the repeals, and I'm, I'm not going to go through this in detail, but it also provides some transition language for the department to prepare for next fiscal year when the money will start to be collected. Um, and, and mostly, um, you know, I'm looking now, it's on line 18. So because the new law does not go into effect until July 1st, 2025, um, this provision in subsection D would give authority to PVR, the Division of Property Evaluation Review, um, to collect from providers an inventory in the same way that they collect for electric utilities now. So it references an existing statute and says, in the meantime, for next in next spring, you know, submit your inventories of your property. Um, and then we can prepare our valuations so that it can be put in the grant list. So that again, just I just wanted you to be aware that there were some tr transitional provisions, but the tax actually doesn't take effect until July 1st of 2025. So page nine, um, section eight, um, section nine, these are really just conforming amendments to reflect the changes and uh, references to the now repealed law. So I won't go into too much detail there. I'm going to now go to section 10. So on page 10, um, this is kind of, this is the, the main statute. Uh, 
and we'll go through uh, the terms, how they're defined, and what the requirements are. So subsection A, all communications property shall be set in the grand list as real estate. Uh, subsection B, and there's a definition for communications property in C, which we'll get to in a moment. Communications property owned by a non-municipal communications service provider shall be taxed at appraisal value as defined in statute, and that basically means fair market value. Again, this is very similar to how electric utilities, electric utility property is taxed. And then, so with the definition of communications property, it means tangible personal property used to enable <coughs> real-time two-way electromagnetic transmission of information, such as audio, video, and data, that is so fitted and attached as to be part of a local state national or international communications network, as well as facilities that are part of a cable television system as defined in statute. So voice and broadband and cable television. All of those networks, all of that infrastructure would fall within this definition and be subject to the same property tax laws. So just by way of example, yeah, sorry. Is that a Thank you, Madam Chair. So how, will this affect in any way like the local access? Like, or no, maybe I'm off here. Like the pay yeah. providers? Uh, no. As far as I know, they don't own any. Okay, I was just curious because it mentioned a lot of stuff here. Thank you. Yeah, for transmission. Um, okay. Yeah. So, yeah. Representative Morris. Thank you, Madam Chair. All right, I know uh, I'm a select board member and I sit on the Board of Civil Authority and we've looked at how to tax or how to uh, assess uh, equipment such as what is communication towers and such and, and other equipment that's listed here. How is, is there some guidance? To there is, yes. Um, that, and that was a big concern. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so first, and that comes, it's, it's going to come right up in the next couple of subsections, but I did just want to go back. So on line 12, um, I'm still on page 10, you know, just to clarify a little bit more about what type of property is encompassed here, wires, cables, conduit, pipes, antennas, poles, wireless towers, machinery, distribution, hubs, splitters, switching equipment, routers, servers, power equipment, and any other network equipment. So really trying to, as much as possible, specifically identify the, the type of facilities that would be covered here. So then, yeah. in subsection D, um, this specifies that on or before May 1st of each year, Division of Property Valuation Review in the Department of Taxes shall provide the listers in each municipality with the valuation of all taxable communications property of any communication service provider situated therein as reported by the provider to the division. And in terms of how that's reported to the division in subdivision two, I'm now on page 11, line three. So before that May deadline, so on or before March 31st of each year, each communications service provider shall submit to the division a sworn inventory of all its taxable communications property in a form that identifies the valuation of its property in each municipality. It goes on to specify that the division shall prescribe the form of the inventory required under subdivision two and the officer or officers who shall submit the sworn inventory. And then in subdivision four, the valuations provided to the listers pursuant to this section shall be used by the listers in determining and fixing the value of communications property for the purposes of property taxation. This is modeled um, to a great extent, again, on how electric utility property is taxed. There's an inventory that's submitted to the division. The division comes up with the valuations and provides those valuations to the listers. 
And, and I'll, I'll just add, in terms of electric, and I'm assuming the same in this case, it, it's it's standardized costs. They're not looking at, well, the, a line of uh, a, a line is worth so much more per foot in your town than it is in this town. It's, it's pretty standard. Any other questions on this section 10? So section 11 is just specifying, this is the statutory definition of business personal property. So some communications property is taxed currently as business personal property, right? And some towns exempt business personal property from taxation, but this is just clarifying on page 12 that it, the definition does not include communications property taxable under section but for the section we just reviewed, right? So there's no opportunity for a municipality to not tax the property. It's all subject to the tax that was identified that we just walked through. It's not considered business personal property. Then uh, you'll recall that in that section 10, it, it applied to non-municipal providers with respect to municipalities um, like CUDs. They don't pay tax within their own territorial limits. However, um, I'm so I'm now at the very bottom of page 12. Um, and actually, before I, I get to the new language on 21, I'm going to go up to existing law, line 18, which specifies that electric utility poles, lines, and pole fixtures owned by a municipal utility line beyond its boundaries shall be taxed at appraisal value um, basically fair market value. So what comes next, the new language, again, is very similar. So communications property, as it's defined, what we read through, owned by a municipality, such as a CUD, lying beyond its boundaries, shall be taxed at fair market value. Okay. So section 13 is a one-time appropriation. Um, in fiscal year 2025 of $150,000 um, from the general fund to the division of property valuation and review for the creation of a property valuation model for communications property. This was a, an ask by the department to help them develop the model. And that's it for the property tax sections. Are there any questions? So that brings us to page 13, uh, section 14, which starts on line 11. And this is, these are amendments to the statute that is representative Sims mentioned. Uh, statutes, uh, the statute has been around since 1997, but it was updated in 2007 with respect to broadband and wireless. And that is in subsection B. So if you go down, so that, and that's where all the changes occur. So on page 14, line four. So this subsection B under current law is specific to broadband, providers of broadband or wireless communications facilities. And basically what this says is that the agency shall uh, collect a reasonable charge with respect to leases or licenses for access to or use of state owned rights of way within the agency's agency of transportation's jurisdiction. And this provision, there is a waiver provision in current law. The agency may waive the charge, the right of way fee in whole or in part. And now I'm actually just, I just want to you to be familiar with existing law before talking about the amendment. So I'm actually looking at line 11, which, which is now shown up, shown as stricken language. The agency may waive such charge or payment in whole or in part if the provider offers to provide comparable value to the state so as to meet the public good as determined by the agency and the Department of Public Service. For the purposes of this section, the term comparable value to the state shall be construed broadly to further the state's interest in ubiquitous broadband and wireless service availability at reasonable cost. Any waiver of charges or payments 
for comparable value to the state granted by the agency may not exceed five years. And thereafter, the agency may extend any waiver granted for an additional period not to exceed five years if the agency makes affirmative written findings demonstrating that the state has received and will continue to receive value that is comparable to the value to the provider of the waiver, or it may revise the terms of the waiver in order to do so. So I just want you to be familiar with current law. And as was explained, the fees have never been collected. Um, and you're probably familiar with the auditor did do some research and there is a memo um, that kind of describes the auditor's attempt to figure out what's been happening, what's going on. And apparently there were some attempts to come up with comparable value. Um, anyway, I just wanted you to know that that's out there. But so the purpose of the amendments here are basically to ask the agency or require the agency to begin collecting the fees. So going back now to line four on page 14, notwithstanding any other provision of law to the contrary, and unless otherwise required by federal law, beginning on or before October 1st of this year, the agency shall annually assess, collect, and deposit into the transportation fund a reasonable charge with respect to leases or licenses for access to or use of state-owned rights of way by communications service providers or communications property as defined in Title 32. So the definition of communications property that we reviewed for purposes of the property tax section is the same definition here, right? So all that network infrastructure, um, if it's in the state owned rights of way is subject uh, to, and as part of a lease or license for use of that right of way is uh, now subject to the charge. On page 15, you'll see line three, subdivision two. Um, there is uh, a definition for what constitutes a reasonable charge under this section. So for wireless communications facilities, these can be antennas, um, small cell facilities on a telephone pole, for example. The charge is $270, again, annually, for each wireless communications facility. And then with respect to um, communications cables or lines or wires, DSL, fiber, or coaxial cable, there's a per linear foot fee. And then you'll see lines seven through 10, um, there's a tiered approach and the charge starts at 0.02 cents um, for counties that have less than 25,000 uh, people residing in those counties. And then it goes up for um, based on the size of the county. So you'll see Roman numeral two, uh, 0.07 cents in a county that has a population of at least 25,000, but less, but fewer than 100,000. And then for the largest counties in the state, it's a 13 cent charge for linear foot. There are, yeah. Representative Pat. Um, these fees are in statute. What is the, would the process be for making adjustments in the future is needed? So there are there are a couple of provisions here. Um, well, one it gives the secretary, and we haven't gotten there yet, but there's there is a provision that says the secretary um, can adjust the fees based on changes in inflation, up or down, based on the CPI, consumer price index. Um, and then there's also language that says that authorizes the secretary to propose for approval by the general assembly standards and procedures for waiving the fees required by this subsection. So it would have to come back to the legislature in form of a recommendation. There's no other. That typically end up being in the fee bill on an ongoing basis? Uh, typically, yeah, it would be it, it would be in the fee bill, but it could be through any legislative enactment. But I did, I just do want to go back because there are some exemptions and I think Representative Sims talked about that in her presentation. So I'm on page 15. 
line 11. So the charge required by this subsection shall not apply to communications property owned by CD, a small communications carrier as defined in Title 30. That's the definition that's used with respect to broadband grants by the Vermont Communications Broadband Board. Those are eligible entities. Those smaller providers are eligible to get grants to build out broadband. So those small communications carriers are not subject to the right of way fee here. Um, in addition, and this is also similar to language, um, and I think Representative Sims talked about this, any internet service provider, so any private provider that qualifies as an eligible provider under the broadband grant programs. Um, and so those would be any providers that are working with a CUD to build out broadband as part of a universal service plan, right? So you established the Vermont Community Broadband Board, you established a grant program, you defined who's eligible to apply for that grant money. And with respect to larger internet service providers, they're eligible if they're working with a CUD to build out in unserved and underserved locations. And that all has to be overseen and certified by the board. So if a lease or license to access the right of way is part of a universal service plan, that for that portion of the right of way would not be subject to the charge here. Does that make sense? And you, you'll probably hear more about this section in terms of, I would imagine there are leases that cover both unserved and served areas and how that may be should be further defined or clarified in those situations. It's anyway, I wanted you to understand kind of what the intent was with the understanding there might be some nuances or tweaking. Yeah. Hey, Madam Chair, uh, what was, so with uh, line 13 on page 15, a, a communication union district would be exempt. Why were they singled out if privates would or not? So it's really a policy choice. They're municipalities. And just like municipal, I mean, municipalities get, you know, they don't, don't pay taxes. They don't pay taxes. They don't pay property. You know, so it's a, it's really a policy choice. And it's, you know, looking at their status as nonprofits, you know, basically building on areas that are underserved. That's the reason for their existence in many cases. And so just trying to facilitate the work that they're doing in underserved and unserved areas, but it's, it's a policy choice. No, thank you. I, I, yeah. I had forgotten that uh, their municipalities, yep. nonprofits. <clears throat> so there is one more exception. Um, uh, I'm on page 16, line one, subdivision D, a cable television service provider provided the property as part of a cable television system subject to a, to a certificate of public good issued by the PUC. So part of the reason why they are exempted from this right of way fee is cable television providers right now pay a franchise fee of 5% of their cable television gross revenue. This is something that's been going on for many, many decades. Um, that franchise fee is intended to cover several things, but use of the right of way is one of them. So it's kind of folded into this. You want to provide service, you need to pay a franchise fee. It can be up to 5% under federal law. And that will cover, you can't be charged a right-of-way fee in addition to that or above the 5%. So in Vermont, that five, the revenue that's raised by that 5% of television, cable television revenue, is all, all goes to the peg access companies, right? So, but it does include the right of access to right-of-way. So that was the intent here. Um, <clears throat> to exempt them from this right away charge with the understanding they're paying a franchise fee of 5% of their gross. Right. 
So subdivision four, um, I've talked about this already. This is the provision that allows the secretary to adjust the fees to account for inflationary changes as measured by the CPI. And then five, we talked about um, if the secretary has a proposal for uh, waiving the fees to bring that back for legislative approval. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> under the exemptions, uh, is there some reason Belco is not exempted here? What that didn't come up for committee discussion generally. I know there are some concerns, so that's really a policy choice. Um, Belco is the transmission utility, statewide transmission utility. They have a large fiber network that they use for grid management. The distribution utilities also have fiber networks and in some cases wireless facilities that relate primarily to management of the grid. So I would say that's a policy question. Would, if you would like to specifically exempt their communications property. Yeah. Do you know if there was testimony taken from the utilities for Velco on this? I don't think that they testified on this. Uh, and I did uh, electric companies, electric utilities don't pay right of way fees, recurring right of way fees for their electric infrastructure, their poles and wires that are part of the power grid. They're not paying that now. They're not required to pay that now. So your question is, should they pay for their communications facilities? Because under this definition, they could be construed to be a communications provider. So the question is, do you want them to be exempt or not? Because I, I don't think it's actually clear, but I, I understand that that's. Yeah, I don't think it's. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Um, and it's a big part of our energy transition. So then I do. Uh, I mean, I, I have heard from Velco. Uh, this about an exemption, but because there was no testimony, you know, I, I'm also curious about the the utilities as well. So, so then um, I am now on page 16 at the very bottom of the page. Representative, oh, Stimmons, I'm sorry, I need to. Yeah, sorry, thanks, Marcia. So, actually, as a follow up, and this might not be for you, this might be for fight fiscal the estimated revenue changes did that incorporate what like those additions does it incorporate what would be obtained from distribution utilities in Belco? that is a great question but yeah you do you want to talk about that now or do you want to talk about some of the issues related to the fiscal Sure, estimates Tempor here. Tempor yeah. Joint Fiscal Office, if I may. Um, on this piece, we weren't able to forecast a, a, a revenue, um, the revenue impact of this provision simply because there are yeah. so many exemptions and it's unclear currently who is in the right of way, how many providers are utilizing each good foot of right of way. And yeah, so that we just simply don't have enough information to get a number and wouldn't be able to get to the specificity for distribution. Utilities. Oh, mm -hmm. So uh, it will raise money. money. We know that. Yes, like, yeah, we're not exactly. collecting money, so we know it will go. It will raise money, but 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 related to that, um, trying to get a better understanding and inventory of what's out there. So subsection E on line eighteen. Yeah, Sibelia. Yeah, to that end, um, I can think of a hundred reasons why we might want to. Have a better idea of what's out there, but what is the reason that um, pursuing this? Well, specifically with respect to implementing this section of law, you know, I think the agency said that they're not really, they don't have a good grasp on the infrastructure that's out there, where it is. So that was part of the issue of, you know, trying to enable them. To understand better who's using their right of way, what's there, and and 
for their own management of the right of way and for collection of the fee once they start collecting it. So, so you know, I note that there's a study a little further down on this, but I think it's on the same kind of, it's on the same topic. So um, over the years, um, you know, there's been, I've heard a number of folks express desire to understand, uh, you know, what where fiber is, where Velcro's fiber is, where um, other state agencies' fiber is, uh, particularly in the rights of way. And um, I'm not necessarily opposed to that, but one of the big concerns that I have also heard and I share is around security. And especially since, you know, I'm hearing we, agency of transportation doesn't know what's in their right of way. Um, you know, we're asking for an inventory. <clears throat> so, you know, as you're going through this, um, I'm really interested in what um, uh, what privacy or confidentiality um, aspects are have been envisioned um, in terms of what is found in the right of way or what is possible. <clears throat> yep. So that that's a great point. Um, so let's kind of address them in order. If we can, let's just, because we'll talk first about the inventory that the providers need to provide to the department, the agency. And then the next subsection is, is the report back to the legislature, the information that's provided to you. So in subsection E, beginning January 1st of next year and annually thereafter, the holder of a lease or license pursuant to subsection B of this section shall provide a detailed inventory of all the property in the state right of way pursuant to such lease or license. The inventory shall include the regulatory status of the lease or license holder, categorization of all communications property by type and by its location in the right of way, and a description of the service or services enabled by such property as applicable. So it's voice, login, cable television, so that's what will be submitted annually to to the agency of transportation. Yes, would have and if it doesn't say that, it should. And I don't think it does say that now that you asked that question. So yeah, we have access to that information. So that is a good question. I think your point about whether this is critical infrastructure and whether it should be publicly available is a valid point. I think it's an open question in the state that we haven't really. Um, yeah nailed down yet at this point. Um, you know, we have some private providers yeah. maybe there that I would consider critical infrastructure, though they didn't. So two things. Oh, These inventories that go to the agency, and you're just pointing out that it should say very specifically that the inventories go to the agency. They go to the agency. Whether the agency publicly discloses it is another conversation of a good question, right? But that's... but. There's no reason why the providers can't provide the agency the information, even if it's kept confidential, not publicly disclosed. So, and my question is around the ability to keep it confidential. So we have public advocates who have been looking for this information for a long time. Uh, so is it, you know, is that- It would be subject to the same, you know, the same exemptions or, you know, the Public Records Act. So, however, that information is treated now, those rules are not changed here. So, so if it was critical infrastructure, is that something that would be able to be kept confidential? Do you know, not off the top of my head. I don't know what you know. But what is public, what's reported back to you, is an aggregated statewide inventory. So, not by provider. Um, whether it's detailed maps, um, whether that's, you know, it's kind of left to the agency to determine in some sense how best to aggregate. It could be an itemization of the number of facility. You know, I think that's a, it's a good question. How do you want to see that? And maybe a conversation with the agency about what they feel should be publicly shared. Could help us understand um... So I'm specifically concerned about how um, uh, the public access to this information. So you know, an appeal to to have this information. Who could help us understand how to 
think about what is, what should be. Critical infrastructure, what should be protected? And is there anything that is, I, I guess, actually, I see the departments here. So the department maybe has, the yeah, can also department does that. Yep. Because they do some mapping and information. The PUC has data, yeah. you know, and to some, to some degree, it's a policy choice. And it's also informed by what are the consequences of sharing information and there are some federal parameters that you can look at, you know, to determine. There's a lot of property that's covered here, so I don't know if there's a broad that applies to each, you know, provider and each category of property. And so I'm a little hesitant to say. Um, yeah. So you can see what's up. Yeah. Yep. So just with respect to that report back, just wanted to read through one subsection F. Um, so beginning on January 1st of 2026 and annually thereafter, the agency shall submit a written report to the General Assembly itemizing all charges and payments collected under this section as well as an aggregated statewide inventory of the communications property described in subsection E and the statewide inventory shall be shared with the commissioner of taxes, the commissioner of public service and the secretary of administration. One of the things, um, and again, just trying, these are all entities that use this information or parts of this information and in trying to make sure that it's consistent um and shared um as needed the secretary of administration part of why the secretary was referenced here is because in statute the secretary oversees leases and licenses licenses to wireless facilities on state lands or state buildings um however and i actually didn't know this until a week ago the secretary of digital services now takes over that responsibility. So that might be something to clarify in statute. That might be something to amend that statute because it isn't obvious unless you're looking under the Secretary of Digital Services responsibilities. And anyway, I just wanted you to know why Secretary of Administration was referenced here and why it might need to be the Secretary of Digital Services instead. Um, I hope that makes sense. But there's a lot covered here and just trying to make sure all the laws are consistent and definitions and everything throughout the titles. So the agency did recommend two new positions uh, to help implement this section, one temporary full-time position and one permanent full-time position. And so that's what you'll see in section 16, which is on page 17. Um, and there's an appropriation to fund those positions from the general fund of $250,000 in fiscal year 2025. 20, and so I also just wanted to quickly go through the effective dates. So the act takes effect this July. Um, however, the universal service fund and the change in the contribution method does not occur until July 1st of next year. The, remember we talked about the property tax, the transitional pieces, um, those would take place right away. Um, and then the actual new property tax, the assessment or the, the application of that new tax would take effect next year. Um, and that's it. So one more, but there's not. So, thank you for that. Do you have any more immediate questions? Just have uh, only because I, Maria, yeah. can you stay with us? Sure. Um, our next witness has a time limit. Great. Sure. Thank you.
Hello. Hello. Um, for the record, Ted Barnett Joint Fiscal Office. I'm going to share my screen so I can run through the fiscal note that um, is also on the committee webpage, from what I understand. Um, I'm going to start and talk in very general terms about the three discrete pieces of the bill and their revenue impacts, starting with the 72 cent monthly per line charge um, that would go to the Universal Service Fund. Um, we're estimating that that line charge would generate um, almost $8 million, of, of which $3 million is additional annual revenue compared to the current 2.4% retail telecommunications charge, and that goes to the Vermont Universal Service Fund. Um, for the next piece, which is the repeal of the telephone personal property tax um, and the associated transition mechanism, um, we're anticipating a $2 million annual revenue loss from that tax type. Um, we'll note that the general fund is um, backfilling um, the gap in current revenues um, for and providing appropriations to um, E911. So this revenue loss can be kind of thought of as, as, as being slightly um, adjusted by that <clears throat> um, freeing of general fund dollars. The um, inclusion of communications property on the grand list, um, we're forecasting two and a half to $5 million in annual revenue from that piece. Um, and that revenue would flow to the education fund as non-homestead property taxes. And then finally, as mentioned earlier, um, just not able to estimate um, the revenue impact from the state right of way fee. Um, there's just too many unknowns within that. So those are the general, that's the general look. Um, in addition um, to those revenue impacts, there is a one-time $150,000 appropriation PBR to implement or to build a property valuation model for communications property. And then um, section 16 will also authorize two positions and provide a one-time um, $250,000 appropriation in fiscal year 25 to the agency of transportation. And so this next table shows where um, these different revenue impacts hit different funds within the state fiscal landscape. Um, the education fund would see two and a half and five million dollars of additional revenue starting in fiscal year 26. The general fund would lose two million dollars starting in fiscal year 26. Um, the transportation fund would see that slight positive revenue um, and the universal service fund starting in, in fiscal year 26 would see um, $3 million in additional dollars compared to current law. Representative Smith. Thank you. Uh, I'm a little confused, and believe it or not. Uh, I understood that from Representative Sims that there were, there were going to be no additional fees or expenses to this. And I see that by, re by dropping the universal fund, you lose $2 million dollars but the 72 cent monthly charges is gonna generate 7.96 million. So that doesn't sound like a break even point to me. It sounds like there's additional charges being uh, uh, spent by consumers. Am I right or wrong? So the way I would think about that is first taking the universal service fund piece um, and currently that revenue type is raising um, around $5 million. And so the idea is to repeal that because it currently isn't providing enough resources for the available uses in the fund and replacing that with the monthly per line charge. And so this <laughs> idea is to keep it, to make all the, the entities within that fund whole um, with a new revenue type that's more stable and will grow over time as compared to the current 2.4% charge that is based on, is, is on a declining base. So somebody out there in the state of Vermont is going to be paying more money for something, aren't they? To generate more revenue. So on net, um, wireless providers would see a slight increase in their monthly bills um, for the monthly charge compared to the current proportional charge. And landline consumers would see a slight reduction just because of the way this has to be um, the way the current proportional charge is levied on voice services only. It looks to me like 7.96 million and 2.5 million is about 
a little over 10 million, if I'm figuring that right. So that's additional money that's going to be made. Am I correct? Yes, but and and that has to be weighed um, against um, repealing the either the current two point four percent charge um, and the telephone personal property tax. So some things are being added, some things are being taken away, um, and so the ten dollars in additional or the ten dollars in revenue is is balanced by also repealing different sources. Okay. For now, thank you. Mm -hmm. To go in a little more detail into um, the Vermont Universal Service Fund, um, did a little analysis between current law and how um, the allocations within the new proposed funding structure would work. And this is shown in the table um, presented here. Um, in FY23, uh, the 2.4% charge generated just shy of $5 million. Um, VCBB received $800,000. The fiscal agent, $100,000. TRS, $60,000. Lifeline, $150,000. And E911, $3.8 million. Um, by moving to a per line charge on um, postpaid consumers and, and landline folks and retaining the 2.4% on prepaid wireless, um, that would generate almost $8 million. Um, the VCBB would see a slight increase because they're receiving a proportionate amount of revenues within the Universal Service Fund. Um, so that would, their revenue piece would, um, or their funding would increase to $1.35 million. The fiscal agent would see a little bit more. They're administering a larger fund. Um, and yes, a, a little couple hundred thousand for TRS, or Telephone Relay and Lifeline, and then E911 is estimated kind of growing their fiscal year 25 request of um, 5 million to 5.1 million in fiscal year 26. And then 988 would have up to a million dollars within the fund. We did not forecast a specific amount for 988 because their services are growing. They currently have federal grants and it's unclear by fiscal year 26 what their overall funding need. Um, would be by then. So showing this line that they, in the, the waterfall structure, they would have up to a million dollars before the fund funds out of money. Um, and the connectivity fund would receive any balances that are left over from those uses. So um, I am wondering about the, so the fiscal agent's getting an increase and if I'm right, they're getting 10% of $10 million. They are getting closer to one. Point one three. Okay. Point, point one three. Yes. So that's one hundred thirty thousand, and that's just a forecast based on. I, I believe the fiscal agent services are, are contracted through um, the Department of Public Service, and so these numbers are presented kind of for guidance as an estimate of what the fund might look like. The money goes to the Department of Public Service. Does it go to a private entity? So the fiscal agent is Solix, and they're the ones who collect and then remit funds, and the amount they retain for administrative expenses depends on that contract. Representative Sims. This is helpful. I did double check um, with the department whether um, this current fiscal agent construct is a preference or whether they would want to take this in-house. And the feedback that I received from the department was that they're happy with this arrangement that might be more expensive to take this in-house. And is it along the lines of $100,000 right now? Yeah. Perhaps uh, my, perhaps my math is not as great as it should be, but it appears everyone is going up except a lifeline. Yes. And again, these are estimates. These are not appropriations. The reason Lifeline is forecasted to decrease is need. It's, it's based on um, the amount of people who apply for Lifeline credits, and that's a $4.25 um, per month discount on voice services. And so as the base of folks who are getting support for their landline services decreases, um, there are fewer people who receive support for those.
I wonder if there's actually just had someone contact me who has um, tinnitus in voice over IP and cell are really problematic for them. So interesting. So I wonder if they would qualify for Lifeline. Is uh, he's gonna Hunter's on. Representative Sims. I'm just, I think, an important thing to know, you've, you've said this a couple of times, but it's sort of not integrated right here. That 3.8 for E911 has not sufficiently met the demands for that program. And so we have been backfilling that with general fund. Um, and so, uh, you know, there's a sort of savings of general funds of 1.5 million. If we can move in this direction to stabilize the base. So moving along, so the rest of the fiscal note is detail around the various fiscal estimates that are included. Um, I will note that particularly for um, taxing communications properties, real estate, the estimate of 2.5 to 5 million um, is, is based on um, the amount of communications property that is currently shown in states that centrally assess um, this this equipment, um, and so and we're scaled down to Vermont. So we don't have a currently we don't have a, a an inventory of of this type of property. So it is, is based on the experiences of other states. Um, yes, and I did want to present this table in um, for that would provide some background for right of way fees. Um, this is showing that the amount of miles of state right away that are contained in different the different tiers um, of charge per foot of usage of the state right away, um, the amount of mileage in um, counties with population um, that's less than 25,000 people is, is fairly limited. It's only 166 miles. Um, the bulk of that mileage occurs in this middle tier that's seven cents per foot. Um, and that's for in counties with population um, greater than 25,000 and less than 100,000. Um, and that's 2,367 miles. And then um, the counties with population more than 100,000, that's Chittenden County, um, and it has 174 and a half miles of state right away. But what I just wanted to provide that is as context, but again, there's <laughs> not enough information to really understand how much of that right away within each tier is being utilized and, and by how many different providers. So that brings me to the end of the fiscal note. I'm happy to answer any questions. Members have questions? Yeah, Sibelia, do you have any? On the fiscal note? Yeah. Uh, I don't think the fiscal note deals with the security issues that I was bringing earlier, so. Thank you. Okay. Sure, thank you. Let's go to the next witnesses and then bring Ray back. So, um, Dylan's wiki. <coughs> Thank you very much. Uh, Dylan Zwicky with Lee 9 Public Affairs uh, here today on behalf of New England Connectivity and Telecommunications Association, or NECTA. Well, NECTA is the regional uh, trade group representing predominantly the private telecommunications providers, cable companies uh, here in Vermont, uh, Massachusetts, Connecticut, Rhode Island, uh, and Massachusetts. Um, happy to talk to you about H657. There are a number of provisions in the bill that, as you might imagine, do impact uh, NECTA member companies and their customers. Uh, we did have the opportunity to weigh in uh, with the Ways and Means Committee and are appreciative of a number of the changes that they made to the bill that we think uh, help relative to the bill as introduced in terms of opera operationalizing some of the uh, proposed changes in, in H657. Um, the bill would have a cost both to the companies and to our customers here in Vermont. Um, so I'll just take the opportunity to kind of highlight uh, how that will play out for them 
Um, with respect to the change to a, a property tax mechanism, uh, it would change how property taxes are assessed and paid by cable operators uh, and other communications providers in the state. Uh, our member companies currently pay uh, property taxes to municipalities on real property, so buildings and land, uh, and business personal property on cable, fiber, and other facilities in municipalities that assess per business personal pop property. Uh, the property tax rates do vary um, as they're set by um, different cities and towns in terms of uh, where that infrastructure is located. Um, this bill creates a new definition of communications property and will now treat all communications property, telecom, wireless, cable, so on and so forth, as real property um, instead of pers business personal property. Um, and the valuation will be done centrally and at a, a state level. Um, so we're neutral on the shift to a statewide assessment um, and believe the Ways and Means Committee did some good work in terms of ensuring clarity there and, and, and ensuring competitive neutrality across different types of providers. Um, to be clear, this will represent an increase in the cost of deploying and operating broadband networks uh, in Vermont. Um, but because it is done in a, in a, I think, a competitively neutral way, uh, we don't feel strongly about that shift. Uh, second, the change made to moving to a, a per line uh, assessment um, will result in an increase to customer bills. That is, at the end of the day, a charge that is paid by uh, customers. Um, but we appreciate some of the technical changes that the Ways and Means Committee made in terms of um, providing a very clear definition of line. As you heard from uh, Council, it's really important to determine which, you know, there are larger businesses that may have multiple lines, not all of which are capable of accessing 911 or, or dialing simultaneously. So that definition mm -hmm. of Line is really important and think it's in pretty good shape coming out of the uh, Ways and Means Committee. Um, with respect to the right of way fee, we appreciate the Ways and Means Committee's recognition that cable operators currently pay the 5% uh, franchise fee um, as Representative Sims and your council noted, all of that money currently goes to Vermont's public access stations. It's somewhere in the order of six to $7 million annually that goes to fund a variety of, of different operations. Um, and uh, finally, earlier versions of the bill did include some what we would consider to be very problematic uh, provisions. Thankfully, the, the committee uh, was receptive to testimony from NECTA and other stakeholders and um, feel like by striking some of those provisions, the bill is in is a, a much better place. Um, so, in summary, the changes included in 657 will result in uh, increased costs to both cable operators, communications providers, and their customers in Vermont. Um, but because of the work that the Ways and Means Committee did do in terms of some of that technical aspects, I um, feel that it is easier for us to operationalize some of the changes that would uh, go into effect if, if 657 were to be enacted into law. There's no questions? Um, not on this aspect. I have other questions for the witness, if that's possible. I think it's fine if the witness is okay with that. So I believe that you rep, uh, you have another client, actually. Um, is it appropriate to ask you um, about GMP? Yeah, let me take this hat on. Oh, put the other hat on. Sure. So um, just related to the question at, or the discussion we were having around uh, what is in and not in the right of way in terms of fiber and inventory. Um, and uh, we've heard from Belco, um, the uh, electric utilities, um, they have fiber. They do. They do. Um, we appreciate that there is some level of ambiguity there and also that we don't understand that the intent of the Ways and Means Committee is to assess um, electric utilities, distribution or transmission or otherwise. Um, and so if it would provide the committee and other stakeholders with some additional comfort to just add to the list of exemptions, electric distribution and transmission utilities, I think that would be the clearest possible path. Um, There's two things. There's two things that are going on here. Mm -hmm. One is fees. And the other is collection of information. And um, the thing to be really clear that um, I'm most concerned about is the second. 
um, collection and then access to that information. Um, and I appreciate and, and I'm very sensitive to the utilities um, on the first part. So I think if that was not the intent of the Ways and Means Committee, it would be good to have intent language there. But um, around the security issue, um, I would definitely be interested in hearing more from the utilities um, about and, and the department about how widely that information is currently shared, um, if there are any concerns with sharing that information, and if it's it's already information that's known. If we're creating a new, yeah, I just think it would be, it's good to understand what the current status is in terms of uh, public access to that knowledge, uh, where it's now, since we're proposing to collect more, specifically with the utilities. Yep, uh, happy to follow up with more information there. I do know that um, there are a variety of different federal agencies that govern govern uh, kind of what information is shared that might be uh, subject to potential public threats. I know we deal with that on a regular basis, and so um, certainly would want would not want to be in a position of being required by state statute to share information that could put some of that critical infrastructure at risk. And so that. It sounds like perhaps there would be an easy answer to this if there's federal language that prevents that from being shared. Just understand <clears throat> that it would be good to understand. I think we need to understand. I, I can follow up with more information. For the department, probably. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Joining us on Zoom, Jeremy Crandall. Yes, good afternoon. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Great. Uh, Chair Sheldon, Vice Chair Sibilia, members of the committee. My name is Jeremy Crandall. I'm testifying today on behalf of CTIA, the Trade Association for the Wireless Industry, in opposition to the House Bill 657 before you. I did testify before your committee last year as well, so it's good to to be talking to you all. I appreciate the opportunity, especially to present remotely here today. Um, I'm going to separate my testimony into two parts and also keep it relatively brief here. First, on the issue of taxes, by virtue of the name of this bill, it is, of course, focused heavily uh, and centrally on the communications industry. We do encourage you to weigh uh, the potential impacts of the tax components uh, related to the Universal Service Fund change. Um, we do feel this change will shift more of the burden to low and moderate income families with family share wireless plans because of how wireless pricing plans are structured. Um, and so we would very much encourage you to think about that element related to taxing the personal property of wireless providers as real property. Like all businesses, wireless providers pay property taxes on any real property that they own. We think that approach should continue. I will just, I'm going to, I'm going to stop there on taxes, um, more specific details about the impacts of these changes are in my written testimony that you all have. Um, my colleague, Scott Mackey, who does a lot of work in your state, I know he has spoken on the tax elements um, as well. The second piece that I really want to encourage this committee to take a closer look at before taking action, and you all have had a discussion about it here today, is this provision in the bill requiring our providers to quote, pro to provide quote, a detailed inventory of all property in the state right of way. This is, as the council noted, this is on section 14. This is section 14E on pages 16 and 17. Um, first, we feel this is redundant with already existing state government processes required under Vermont state law. Um, and the manner in which this data collection is outlined is substantially vague and unclear uh, to our members. Um, it is our understanding, and again, the council did reference this, but it is our understanding the current state law already designates the Secretary of Administration as the exclusive licensing and leasing agent for wireless facilities on state property, including state roads, and that's under Section 227B. And so as such, the Secretary should already have all the leasing and licen licensing information necessary for this information collection we're talking about. This also includes for any small sites authorized under the state's 248A siting process, the department and the PUC should have this information as well. So beyond who is collecting or already has collected that information, the bill is also vague in general about the data collection itself. And so for example, how do we define a type of, if, and I mean us on the provider side, 
how do we define a type of communications property or a description of service? Um, I will just say going even further, leaving to the side what our members are already doing related to Vermont Section 227B, the bill is drafted, and I just want to walk through this or, or describe all this. It would require members to collect information on wires, cables, conduit, pipes, antennas, <laughs> poles, wireless towers, machinery, distribution hubs, splitters, switching equipment, routers, servers, power equipment, and any other network equipment. That is a pretty substantial list. And so um, given that there is a construct that already exists in state law around this issue, and the ambiguity around the data collection under uh, under 220 between uh, 227B and what the bill is prescribing, we would oppose this provision as, as currently drafted. And so I will pause there. Happy to answer any questions. Sure. Thanks for joining us on short notice. Um, can you just edify us a little further about who your members are? Yes, I'd be happy to. So again, we represent the wireless industry. Um, our core members in Vermont include AT&T, T-Mobile, uh, US Cellular, Verizon, DISH, um, American Tower. And then we also represent um, uh, around 200 or so other um, important players or, or, or industry, excuse me, uh, um, entities within the wireless industry. So Apple and Samsung are examples of, of non-carriers, if you will, that we represent as well. But I'd be happy to share the, the larger list with you all. Thanks, that gives us a good idea. And um, I'm curious, that it sounds like a long list of things you'd inventory, but I would assume those businesses would know their assets and that it wouldn't be that cumbersome for them to share those. Yeah, so that's a that's a very fair question. The key here, what I really want to emphasize, and and I will be extremely candid with you all. This, you know, this bill, you know, was in the other committee as well. This change in sec section fourteen specifically, this data collection came along a bit more quickly, and so we have been, you know, trying to analyze it as quickly as we can. Um, what I really want to emphasize, it, the concern is that if there is already a construct in state law that let's not create an entirely separate one that very well may be different. And so um, I'm in the process of, of collecting more information about your question. How much data do we have as it relates to that list that I described? But the key here is let's let's not do two things when one already exists. Do members have questions? All right, thank you for your testimony today. Yeah, thank you very much. Appreciate you having me. Do you want to have Maria? Uh, I mean, we could. It's, um, that's a good part, actually, about how we're currently. Oh, Maria is still here. Yeah. Representative Pat. I just, uh, trying, I, I would like a, a little bit of a, a sense of what our committee's role is in this as opposed to the other committee. Yeah, I mean, I think we're kind of finding our way. So we're yeah. the policy committee and they're the money committee. And this bill is um, between us. <laughs> it's, uh, we have both. And I think Representative Sebelius identified a policy area that she's interested in. You have some that you're concerned about? No, no. no. I mean, I'm, I'm just, I mean, there's, there's a, the other committee did a lot of work, obviously, on the, rev, on the revenue side without getting into whether we, I like one thing or another in, in it, um, and uh, so I'm, I'm just I'm just wondering. My my gut sense is we should define what our we should understand what our role is here and what their purview is. Uh, you know, so we're not sort of getting wires crossed. I guess. <laughs> so to speak. If I, if I can make a that was intended as a pun. Yeah. Well, they're the money committee and we're the policy committee yeah. and it's not always clear. <laughs> <laughs> so we're, we're getting the overview today. And if members have policy concerns, we should bring them forward. Representative Sebelia. Yes, just to um, uh, Representative Pat's question. I, I think what this bill largely is, is changing the USF. Um, without making a lot of policy changes, um, with the but but the right of way I think is um, yeah not that so that is different and that is 
something I think we need to understand or see how strongly they feel about keeping it in. Yep. <laughs> okay. And with that, the bell is about to ring or is ringing. So Madam Chair, can we, I, I would like to hear at least from the department, I think, and yeah. probably Maria, and it sounds like it may be that this is <clears throat> a possibility that this is not a big issue, but I don't think there was a lot of testimony taken, so there's also a possibility that. I'd love to see you talk about it. I need to go to the men's room. Um, I don't know if everybody heard you. Yeah. <laughs> I don't I think, care. I think that's okay. All right. I don't care. Um, got it. We will, so the floor may be short, and if the floor is short, we will be, we can come back to committee and see if we can finish this up and get the department in. So heads up for that. Um, and if it's ambiguous, I'll make an announcement. With that, we're adjourned. <laughs>